to the National Weather Service uh, the director there, Louis Uccellini, giving us an update on their the, thoughts uh, on what's the, going to be taking place. A big upgrade to 2.8 petaflops per machine, so we're up to 5.6 petaflops for our total operational capability. And we're now moving the models uh, onto that system. So the next upgrade of the GFS with the four-dimensional data assimilation will be on those new machines. Um, we also had um, an enhancement out of the... In, that, that system, by the way, was paid for by the Sandy Supplemental, uh, which also contributed to the um, uh, supporting our modeling team, uh, who have been really tremendous in working these model upgrades into uh, operational system and reaching out to the research community more effectively for those upgrades. And I just want to, again, emphasize the role of the forecasters uh, from the national centers, the weather forecast offices, the river forecast centers, uh, which you also played a huge role in the Christmas uh, storm in the central part of the country. And uh, with the Central Weather Service units, which are working with our Aviation Weather Center and uh, weather forecast offices to uh, keep the aviation folks upgraded, updated on these forecast changes. You're going to be seeing a lot of decisions made by the aviation community probably starting tomorrow. And our folks throughout that whole spectrum of forecast offices are working uh, with the aviation community. And uh, these folks really know how to work with the models. It's not just here are the models, you know, read off, read, uh, rip and read kind of thing. For the older folks, they probably know what I mean there. Um, there's a lot of work that goes in and sorting out uh, even the little inconsistencies that uh, people tend to overlook um, at times. You play important roles in exactly the decisions that are going to be made. So um, I just want to emphasize that again. Our, our people are really busy, and for some of these forecast offices that are going to be directly affected, you'll, you'll be seeing a number of people sleeping in the offices um, as, this, uh, as this event directly impacts them. So um, really uh, proud uh, to be their leader. Um, they're, really, um, they're really doing a great job on this system. So um, I, think, um, I think I'll end there. And, um, uh, be ready to take any questions. We have a question in the room. You're welcome to come up to the podium. Or, I'm sorry, come up to the microphone. <coughs> Louis Seth Borenstein at AP. Two questions. Actually, many more, but I'll just limit it to two. Um, first, Given your uh, history and knowledge of, of winter storms, can you put this in some kind of historical context? What's a good analog? Is this likely the one the worst in a decade, a, a generation, century? How unusual is this, you know, looking back at all the winter storms you've written about and seen? And, and, and secondly, this isn't El Nino, right? This doesn't have a polar vortex. I mean, can you explain why it's so strong? Um, what's making this so such a big, scary thing? Okay, well, you know, see me next week with, for the historical comparison. Um, the uh, the way the models are setting up, it's certainly a classic pattern. I mean, some of the uh, uh, specific features that uh, Paul Cosen and I, who, when we wrote the book, and in fact, Paul's on the winter weather desk today, you know, so you've got him uh, and his forecast to work with. Um, that the classic dynamic and thermodynamic patterns, all of those ingredients that we identified as being uh, specific to these intense storms, which is a relatively rare event, by the way, um, are in play, and the models have certainly captured, uh, captured those features. So, you know, I can go into double jets, I can go into the low-level jet, I can go into all, any aspect of these storms. These models not only have, uh, are capturing that in these later runs, but they actually developed them um, as we were predicting this storm seven, six, five, four, three days ago. So um, there's, um, th so, you know, from that point of view, uh, you get, you pull all the ingredients together, um, um, you can get a storm like this, and those ingredients are being pulled together, and they're starting to come together now in real time. And I should point out that this is why these, this is why these forecasts can go wrong, all right, because um, every single one of these uh, separate ingredients um, can be very nonlinear, and the fact that the models have consistently predicted them up to this point is remarkable. We've still got 30 hours to go, all right? 
So, um, so there's still a bit of uncertainty here that we're, we're dealing with, um, even as we make our forecast. And your second question again? Uh, if this is not El Nino, yeah, oh, El Nino. So, yeah, so El Nino is providing a background um, part of the story. Um, usually you get into the January, February time frame and you start seeing your low pressure systems actually develop more of a southern track. You start getting your severe weather outbreaks along the Gulf Coast into Florida. This is, um, so that is related to the strengthening jet over the Pacific, which is directly related to El Nino. So I wouldn't say that El Nino has no impact on this. It really does set up the background state for a storm system like this to develop and track the way it is tracking. Peter Zampa from Great Television. Uh, naturally, with each of these massive storms, uh, you have folks who are saying, oh, they always hype it up to be a lot worse than it really is. Uh, what can you say to people who might be taking this storm lightly? Yeah, so here, you know, I actually thought about this last night because that was one of the first comments I got from my son up in New York. Um, the, um, you know, if we weren't making a forecast, we know what it's like when we didn't have any forecasts and storms like this hit. You know, over f uh, nearly 500 people died, you know, in New York City, um, you know, during the blizzard of 88. There were books written on uh, kids getting killed out in blizzards in the Midwest because they, back in the 1800s, because they didn't have, uh, you know, they didn't know it was coming, right? So you have that as one bookend, right? And then you have, as the other bookend, um, the ability to forecast the storm system. And what happens if you extend that prediction five, four, three, two days in advance? Um, the fact is, is that all of our forecasts are open to the public for their view. I think the public is becoming a lot more aware of, you know, the models and, and actually make their own interpretation. Anybody with a cell phone can can pick up weather information. I think every every cell phone come every there's so many apps on weather, right? So. Um, we, what we need to do is at least bring it into what we believe is possible to probable uh, with the idea that um, at certain stages uh, you, you're reaching a level of confidence where people can take action. Um, I would suggest that people pay attention to this system. Uh, there's enough consistency in all the models, uh, not only in, in time but from run to run, um, that they should take action. Um, could something go wrong between now and with respect to the forecast between now and tomorrow night? Sure. But the likelihood of that is a lot less than, um, than the fact that what we've seen so far for the last five or six days is going to carry right on. And, and if that happens and people haven't taken action uh, and they're driving on 995 on Saturday night, you know, their lives are at risk, okay? So, so we, uh, we need to convey as best we can, the forecast as we see it and the level of confidence and certainty in it, and uh, work with the uh, decision makers accordingly uh, so that they can work with the general population in terms of the decisions that have to be made. Aixa Diaz with Hearst Television. How rare is it to have the models have this much consensus? And what else makes this snowstorm, this impending storm, so unique? If that's one of the uh, characteristics of it that makes it remarkable, what other unique qualities does it have? I, I, in terms, I don't remember seeing four or five modeling systems having this much consistency, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one day in advance. Uh, there have been, diff been differences in there, you know, some models have been slower uh, moving it up the coast than others, others have been too fast. Um, back seven days, six days ago, there was a difference between whether it was 200 miles off the coast or on the coast, but then everybody converged to more of a coastal system. But to have this level of consistency and, um, and then the run-to-run -run consistency, um, I, I, we're, li we're living in interesting times, okay? I mean, I just, I haven't seen that. So uh, that has uh, led uh, to a large extent to, I think, the entire enterprise, not just the weather service, but the entire forecast enterprise, you know, saying at some point it's time to get this information out with a level of confidence um, that will, you know, that they can convey to this. Um, the other interesting thing about this, uh, when this storm, when 
the models were picking up on this storm. The, uh, the upper level features which helped drive the development of these storms were located in the northern and western Pacific Ocean. And usually we have, an we have some fibrillation with respect to systems that are coming across the North Pacific. Um, uh, it's, it's not just a matter that we predicted a storm here, it's that it's predicted for the same reason, uh, run after run. Um, I was struck by that as I was watching it. So there are interesting aspects about uh, these model forecasts, which I'm sure there'll be a lot of students out there uh, working on their theses on. questions in the room. Ted, we'll go ahead and start taking some questions from the phone. Sure, the phone lines are now open for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 and record your name. If you'd like to withdraw your question, press star 2. Thank you. You got any more? Anthony Wood with the Philadelphia Inquirer. Your line is now open. Hello? Hello, Tony. Hello, you can hear me? Yep. Um, two quick questions for you. Uh, first of all, what is the potential for the uh, misconception? And uh, secondly, uh, would you expect gravity waves to uh, play any role? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my other, that was my other thesis. Okay, so... Um, Role of convection. There are time periods in these model runs that um, are producing uh, very heavy precipitation, even in the global model at 13 kilometer resolution. And the uh, higher resolution North American model and some of the other higher resolution models are picking up on that. Uh, we're sort of waiting for the uh, about the 24 hour mark that we can run our very high resolution models on. Uh, but it, it looks like the uh, it, at least the conditions are setting up. Um, uh, for tomorrow, late tomorrow afternoon into tomorrow night for that type of um, uh, convective activity to kick in um, probably Saturday, Saturday, uh, I'm National sorry, Weather Saturday. Service yeah, see, I've, I've been tracking been listening on the National before. Weather Service office there that's uh, the National Director uh, Louis Michelini give us an update on uh, basically their thoughts and what mm -hmm. they're thinking a uh, winter storm Jonas is going to be doing for parts of the Mid-Atlantic eventually up into the Northeast as well a lot of details on their thoughts yeah they're talking about the computer, computer model runs and the difference in each computer model so some nice information there and again still focusing in on the heavier amounts of snow staying right across the mid-atlantic but this is also going to have impacts the storm systems storm system on other locations especially into the southeast uh, mm -hmm. seeing some wintry stuff yeah so let's find out how north carolina is getting ready for jonas uh, we've got uh, mark charbonneau hopefully i pronounced that right uh, of the uh, state's dot joining us by way of skype thank you so much uh, for joining us here this afternoon sure thank you it's mike charbonneau but yes you got the last name right all right, thank you so much. All right, so Mike, so give us an update on how the state is preparing because you guys could see a